Welcome to worship today as we gather together to sing praise to our God. We especially welcome those who are guests with us, either in person or watching online. Now please stand as you are able for our entrance hymn. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's now time for the children's message. I don't know if we have any kids coming in through the nursery. Any kids today? Okay, maybe there's some watching online. Um, what do you see that's a little different in here today? The knitting. The knitting, yes, the prayer. These are prayer shawls, and aren't they beautiful? Um, would you stand as you are able if you helped knit any of these prayer shawls here? Okay, all right. I think we need to take some very nice. Um, the prayer shawl ministry, I think, is an incredibly important ministry that we have here at St. Andrews. And um, Sherry coordinated a meeting just the other day to talk a little bit about the shawls and um, to encourage people to make more. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know you wanted to share about uh, a few words about the prayer shawl ministry. So let's have you do that now, please. Just trying to get this up and running again because we are starting to see more and more needs that uh, people from our areas may be needing prayer shawls. So uh, I met with two people, two other people plus Pastor Sally last week and we kind of discussed going forward with them to try to get meetings going every month for six weeks. And I have sent out an email to the people who have expressed an interest to me that they might want to be involved with this ministry. And I also put um, some information in your mailbox. So if you had talked to me before about being interested but you were not able to come to the meeting, please check your mailboxes. We are trying to get a, a meeting set up for August, and I have sent out some possible dates in those emails. Uh, this is the sample that we do. It's very simple knitting. It's um, homespun yarn is what we use because it's very soft, and the directions are included in your mail. So see if you have any questions. Thank, thank you very much, and I know um, you put a little label on here after it's finished, and it says St. Andrew's Knitting Ministry. And I can tell you, I've shared before, but if you weren't here and didn't hear it, I have um, two prayer shawls from other congregations where I served when I had to have major surgery, and what a difference it made to know that I had the love and prayers of my faith community behind me. Um, as I went into surgery and throughout my recovery. And we continue to keep those prayer shawls on our bed or in our bedroom or on a chair so we can cuddle up in them. And our kitties love them too, that's for sure. <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, it's a wonderful, a wonderful way that we can extend our arms to people in need. So if you're ever wondering about giving a prayer shawl to somebody, just see me and then we'll coordinate that. So let us pray. Good and gracious God, we lift up to you this day the prayer shawl ministry. We thank you for the hands and the hearts of those who have tenderly created these shawls. Out of compassion and concern for our sisters and brothers in Christ, these knitters use their gifts in this ministry of love. While we know that you are always present in our lives and that your love transcends all illness and pain. We also know that sometimes a physical reminder can bring hope, healing, and peace. We pray that these prayer shawls bring comfort to those who will receive them. May God's grace be upon these shawls, warming, comforting, enfolding, and embracing. May this mantle be a safe haven, a sacred place of security and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. 
May the ones who receive these shawls be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with, I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is of vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The song pointed for today is Psalm 49, verses 1 through 11. We'll read it responsibly by verse, as marked in your bulletin. Hear this, all you peoples. Hearken, all you who dwell in the world, you of high degree and low, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall meditate on understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb, and set forth my riddle upon the heart. Why should I be afraid in evil days, when the wickedness of those at my heels surround me? The wickedness of those who put their trust in their goods and boast of their great riches? We can never ransom ourselves or deliver to God the price of our life. For the ransom of our life is so great that we should never have enough to pay it. In order to live forever and ever, and never see the grave. For we see that the wise die also, like the dull and stupid they perish, and leave their wealth to those who come after them. Their graves shall be their homes forever, their dwelling places from generation to generation though they call the lands after their own names. Even though honored, they cannot live forever. They are like the beasts that perish. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Colossus. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
her book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, hit the bookshelves in 2014, Marie Kondo has ignited controversy and delight with her rigorous system of decluttering and organizing. Anybody know about her? Okay. The heart of her message is helping people get rid of unneeded things in their homes and closets, things that weigh them down. Hold up each item, she says, and ask yourself, does it spark joy? If the answer is yes, then keep it. If the answer is no, then give it away. In an article for Christian Century Magazine, Catherine Reckless, who's a theology professor at Fordham University, observes this. Kondo doesn't want merely to reorganize your closets. She wants to transform your soul. Watching her Netflix show brings into full relief the missionary edge to her work. And it makes a strong case that most of us need saving. On one of the episodes, a man who was on the cusp of fatherhood sits in his garage, surrounded by piles of stuff. He's supposed to be discerning between items that spark joy and those that don't. So he reaches for a dented metal mailbox, you know, the kind that hangs next to the front door, explaining that it was originally on the first house that he and his wife bought. He connects it to what it meant for him to buy the house and to what that house meant to his parents, who are first-generation immigrants. It turns out he has a very complicated attachment to an object that he's never used and has no intention of using. He turns to Kondo and he says, what do you do with an object like this? Well, she gently asks him, so have you decided that this is an object that you want to bring into your future? And immediately the man relaxes. No, he says, when you put it that way, I definitely don't need this in my future. And on the show, he proceeds to work through a host of feelings that are related to his impending parenthood and his parents and his immigrant past. Of this episode, Professor Reckless observes, that is a lot of emotional labor that's connected with an old metal mailbox. As becomes clear in each episode of the series, she notes, the real work of the KonMari method is transforming people's relationships to things. Think about that transforming people's relationships to things. Maybe that's what Jesus had in mind when he said one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Jesus is in the middle of a long journey, the trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem. It only takes about three days to walk it but Luke spends nearly 10 chapters of his gospel getting Jesus from point A to point B. And all along the way to Jerusalem, Jesus stops. He stops to teach the disciples about the kingdom of God and about what it means for disciples to live a God-centered life. An ever-growing crowd is following Jesus, and then suddenly Jesus is interrupted in his teaching by somebody in the crowd who demands assistance with a family matter concerning things, stuff. Now notice Jesus doesn't want any part in a family feud. As you are well aware, possessions and things can get in, a way, in the way of family relationships. This isn't a new phenomenon. Even in the ancient world, there were disputes over the family inheritance. And this kind of dispute is still familiar in our time. I've seen it happen 
in my own ministry. Families haggling over furniture and dishes and silverware and jewelry, the house, the land, the savings account, all left by the deceased. But Jesus refuses to be referee. Rather, he calls it like he sees it. Be on your guard, he says, against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Greed, you see, teaches that one's life does consist in the abundance of possessions. Now please note, Jesus is not saying don't save for a rainy day. He's not saying get rid of everything you own. Rather, Jesus is saying is that your life is not equivalent to your possessions. Now, that's not a message that we hear out in the world, is it? Out there we hear get, 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 and buy, buy, buy. And the culture instills in us that desire to acquire. Ads and commercials proclaim falsely, I might add, that whatever they are selling is going to bring us joy and give us a better life. And we all get sucked into that. I do too. But Jesus says, no, take care. Life is more than just about things. In fact, I remember seeing, I think it was at Hobby Lobby, there was this big wall hanging that said the best things in life aren't things. Have you ever seen that one? Hmm. Well, Jesus tells a parable. A farmer had this fantastic year and things have really gone his way. There was rain and sun enough to grow these crops and the result is abundance. More produce than he can possibly imagine. A life, his life is, is just overflowing with abundant crops. And then Jesus, in this parable, lets the landowner speak for himself. Notice that he speaks the words, I and my, numerous times. What shall I do? I have no place. I will do this. I will pull down. I will store. My crops, my barns, my grain, my goods, my soul. I, 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 my, my, my. Or as Pastor Barbara Lundblad puts it, I, 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 I. <laughs> you see, the farmer doesn't think of anybody else. He does not acknowledge God as the source of his abundance. He does not acknowledge God as the giver of life. He does not praise God in gratitude for his blessings. He doesn't kneel in prayer to ask God what God would have him do with all of this abundance. He doesn't remember that he has brothers and sisters who are suffering and impoverished and that their lives could be made so much better if he only shared his abundance. He acts as if he's entitled to all of this. He is totally self-absorbed. You see, his sin was not that he was successful, but that he made himself the center of the universe. It's just like we sang in our entrance hymn. This man was rich in things and poor in soul. He had become, as one commentator put it, a bottleneck in the flow of God's blessings to others. And that's why when God finally speaks to him, he speaks to him out of pity, not anger. You fool, as in, oh, you poor fool. The wealthy farmer, thinking he had a lifetime ahead of him, was all set to relax and eat and drink and be merry. But this man's tomorrow was about to be terminated. The clock was clicking down. It says, Steve Jobs once said, death is the destination that we all share. Some years ago, David Brooks wrote a column for the New York Times in which he described the difference between resume virtues 
and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are what you would think, where you went to school, your skills, um, the honors and awards that you got, things that will get your resume noticed and advance your career. And eulogy virtues are vastly different. Eulogy virtues are the ones that people talk about at your funeral, whether you were kind or brave or honest. Was your life one of generosity and compassion? How your faith moved you to be extravagant in giving of your time and talents. There's a story about Alfred Nobel that illustrates rather clearly the difference between these two virtues. One morning back in 1888, Alfred Nobel sat down to read the morning paper and he read his own obituary. I didn't misspeak there. Alfred read his own obituary. You see, it was actually his brother Ludwig who had died from a heart attack in France, but somebody in a newspaper office reached into the file to get Ludwig Nobel's pre-written obituary. I'm told that even now obituaries for famous people um, are the kinds of things that are already prepared in advance. Well, this time, rather than grabbing Ludwig Nobel's obituary from the file, the guy grabbed the death notice of Ludwig's little brother, Alfred. And the next day, the paper headlines read, The Merchant of Death is Dead. Through that reporting error, you see, Alfred got a glimpse of how he was going to be remembered when he was long gone. And it wasn't good. You see, Alfred had become famous for developing new types of explosives, inventing, among other things, dynamite. It was a scathing obituary that branded him a merchant of death who had grown rich by developing new ways to mutilate and kill. Well, this was an awakening for Alfred, and he began to evaluate his reputation to consider how he would be remembered. So he changed his will, leaving the vast majority of his state to a series of prizes. I know you know who I'm talking about now. For those prizes for those who in preceding, the preceding year conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. He listed five awards in his will, physics, chemistry, medicine, literary work, and peace, and then economics was added later. Jesus' words today challenge us to live a life that is rich toward God. But first, we need to consider how God is rich toward us. From the very beginning, God generously loved the world, creating this magnificent earth, breathing life into us that we might share in this creation. In generosity and deep love, God even gave his own dear son that we might share now and eternally in his life. You see, living a life that is rich toward God requires a change of attitude that considers everything we have as a blessing from God and to treasure those blessings by sharing generously. Being rich toward God means placing value on the same things that God values. It means loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. It means loving mercy and acting justly and walking humbly with God. It means opening our hands wide in sharing, sharing our time, our talents, our treasures. And in doing so, we find real and everlasting joy. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Please stand as you are able as we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. Sisters and brothers, children of God, let us come before the Most High with humility, saying, Great and Holy God, incline your ear to us. Set our minds on things divine, O God, that your church may guard itself against the love of earthly things and instead be rich toward you. Great and Holy God, incline your ear to us. May all who dwell in the world, those of both high degree and low, incline their hearts to wisdom and meditate on understanding. Great and holy God, incline your ear to us. Give us grace to be wise and generous stewards, O God. Open our eyes to see your abundance and our reliance. Great and holy God, incline your ear to us. Bless all those to whom we are connected. May we value our relationships more than our possessions. May we realize that in Christ, all human distinctions cease to matter. We pray for justice and peace. Great and holy God, incline your ear to us. Comfort and heal all those who are in pain or sorrow or any kind of trouble. May we, who have known sorrow, pain, and trouble, show them mercy and compassion and remind them of the hope we have in Christ. At this time, you may offer your own intercessions as silently or loud. For the family of Tim Spray as they grieve his passing, that they might be comforted by the resurrection hope. We will sing again. We pray for the following parish families this week. Matthew and Allison Burns, Carolyn and Connor, Marge Camden, Jason Carr, Kevin Carroll, and Joe and Brenda Cessna. Great and holy God, Incline your ear to us. We acknowledge our mortality before you, everlasting God, and we rejoice in the hope of being raised with your Christ. We remember before you the lives of our forebears. May they find in you 
rest from their labors. Great and holy God, incline your ear to us. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things, in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world we have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We greet one another with a safe sign of peace. Welcome to all to worship this morning. Um, we will be very soon celebrating Eucharist. All are invited to God's table of grace, where we believe Jesus is present with us in bread, in wine, loving us, forgiving us, and giving us power to be his, his church, um, his flesh and blood church, 
as we go about our mission and ministry in the world. Um, today, though, for Eucharist, because of the high COVID numbers, we will just be celebrating communion in one kind. You will receive the wafer only today. And we do ask that you maintain some uh, distance and just, if you're not feeling well, um, well, if you're really not feeling well, stay home. But, um, <laughs> but, but don't get too close to folks if you're just, even if, if you're a little, feeling a little sick. Um, because we continue to have folks in the congregation, I know, who aren't with us today because they're home, you know, quarantining for the five days. Um, does anyone have announcements for our life together that they want to share? Okay, yes, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Um, our next edition of the Day by Day Church is in your mailbox. And if you need a spare one, right in front of the mailbox, we will encounter there. There are also uh, additional ones. And uh, if, if you have not used it, take time to look on the front and the back of the book. It has some great centering prayers to help you start your day or perhaps end your day. And the other piece that is really uh, kind of interesting is that you can, the forward day by day is, if I can pull this up, and I hope it's easy to find that. Uh, it actually is an app that is on your phone and it has. Uh, not just the forward day by day, the daily reading, the daily devotional, the daily office, and on and on and on. A lot of prayers in it. So it's a good application. And we heard today from Pastor Sally, <coughs> excuse me, and she's actually been preaching this for over a year. But this is a great tool for you to use to go out in the community for the daily readings. And in the back of the book, it says, and we heard it today, inspire disciples. And empower the evangelists. And that's what we really all are. And it's a great tool again to take it out into the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Labor Day Parade is coming up on Labor Day, which is September the 5th this year. And we are officially going to be part of it. So if you are able to walk, we invite you to come and walk with us. Uh, we've already um, purchased some giveaways. So we have some nice lanyards with our website on it. We also have more wristbands, which were really popular last year. And we'll also be asking for some candy donations over the next couple of weeks. No chocolate, please, because it melts and it probably will be a little warm that day. Um, but I do look forward to seeing some of you come and join us for Labor Day. Thank you. Thank you for taking the lead and coordinating that for us. A um, couple announcements that I want to highlight. Um, again, um, Rebecca, and we, we pray for all of you as you're, as you're mourning the death of Tim Spray. There is a um, viewing today from 2 to 4 at McPeak Hoekstra Funeral Home. It's in Granville. Um, you got an e-blast about this as well, but if you need this specific address, see me after church and I will, I will give it to you. And again, you, you all have our prayers um, as you grieve. And, and, um, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope, right? We, we believe in the resurrection and this meal for us is a meal where we remember that one day we'll all be together with our loved ones again. That's why this, this is the highlight, what we do at the table is the highlight of, of worship every week. Um, and I hope you feel that way, I know it is for me. Uh, lots of announcements for our life together. Um, the, the one that's most immediate is spiritual gifts surveys are finally here. Do you wanna talk about any of those? Sure. Yes, uh, cool.
thank you both for helping to coordinate this. And even if you've taken a spiritual gift survey before, we encourage you to come and, and do it. And the goal is to um, plug people into different ministries that God has entrusted to us here. We want people using the gifts that God has given you to build up the body of Christ. Everybody has a gift to share from the youngest to the oldest, and that's what it's all about. Um, School is right around the corner. We are still collecting backpacks and school supplies. Uh, next Sunday, which it is August 7th. Can you believe that? Okay, people are standing again. You gonna say something about that? Yeah. Cool, all right, I love it. sorting and also passing them out and what we're going to do along with that is put a flyer in with the backpack inviting the children or youth to come back on Sunday August 14th for the blessing of the backpacks which will happen during the worship service on Sunday August 14th and this will be for students for for, for college students that are out there um, for school administrators, teachers, bus drivers, whatever. We want to bless you um, as you go off for the school year. Also on that flyer we're gonna hand out next week is will be information on um, Rally Sunday after Labor Day when we kind of start back up our ministries and talk about our faith formation for children and youth. So um, pray, for the, pray, for, pray that we are blessed and more importantly pray that the community is blessed by, by what we do as we're being the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, I think that's enough announcements for now, so we turn then to the offertory sentence. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name, but do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The offering will now be received.
up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so on this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this. All of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, we re and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine, and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your Spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with Saint Andrew and all your saints, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our A Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. The gifts of God for the people of God.
God's blessing be with you, Christ's peace be with you, and the Spirit's outpouring be with you now and always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.